All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Tenement Museum. My name is Laura Lee, and I manage the public programs here at the museum. I see some uh, new faces in the audience, so I want to welcome you all. I'm just curious, um, I see some familiar faces as well, <laughs> uh, but how many of you have been on a tour here at the Tenement Museum? How many of you have been here before? Okay, so some folks who've never experienced uh, what we do, we tell the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees who actually lived here on Orchard Street. And we try to get our visitors to uh, understand what that experience is like and also make connections to the present. Um, so this conversation we're incredibly excited about because we are constantly thinking of how people are making connections um, and maybe building empathy around stories of migration. Um, and one of the areas where there's kind of growing research around this um, is in, in the realm of gaming and, and how that's happening. So we're excited to learn a lot from our panelists here tonight. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and, and um, kind of take things over but I'm gonna hand the mic to Diana Moreau, who is the Senior Director of Programs and Partnerships uh, for Games of Change. She's gonna moderate our conversation this evening. Thank you, Laura. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Laura said, I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Partnerships at Games for Change. Um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Games for Change. Um, we are a nonprofit organization based here in New York City. We've been around for about 17 years. Um, and really dedicated um, to, the, um, to the games for impact sector. Um, we believe that games are a medium beyond just entertainment value um, and really have a role in learning in health and in civic and social issues and really beyond. Um, and we have an annual festival here in New York and we um, have programming for youth where we train kids um, on how to code and we, we um, educate kids on how to create games around social themes and, so, and social topics. Um, so we've had themes where we partnered with the National Endowment for Humanities on immigrant voices um, and empowered kids to tell stories of immigration um, from their own maybe ideas of what their grandmother went through or their family members. And it's a way to not only talk to older folks in their family and, and connect with the other generations, but a way to um, provide perspective um, that I think really can transform how, how youth are thinking about um, their reality and, and kind of where they came from and, and more about their family history. So um, before I uh, let our other panelists introduce themselves, I just wanted to, uh, Laura said this is okay, um, go around the room real quick if you could just share um, sort of what brought you here or where you're working and how um, you could just give us like a quick, um, I just want to get an idea of who's sort of in the room so we can maybe um, make this more of an interactive conversation as well. Um, so why don't I start with my brave folks in the front row? <laughs> yes, you in the brown sweater. <laughs> <laughs> fascinated by um, was this idea of the interplay between history and how one can learn history through sort of digital entertainment through games what are the ways in which that makes it a unique medium as opposed to like watching a film or reading a book and I think this has some a lot of intersection with that I'm Erin. Hi. Uh, I also work at the museum, and I work at the Rubin Museum as well in Chelsea, and I'm just interested to hear what this is all about. Yeah. Um, hi. My name is Keith. Uh, I run a wearable technology company called WearWorks, and we build uh, products and experiences that communicate information through touch, haptics, um, and we help the first blind person run a New York City Marathon with outsided assistance. Um, so impact is super important to me. I'm also a teacher at uh, City Tech, and I teach in their um, emerging media and technology program. Basically, it's a bunch of game designers. Um, and so the games part was really interesting to me. And I was, I'm was, i also a gamer myself, like hardcore. And so I'm trying to figure out how migration fits into this whole thing. So that was deeply uh, exciting for me. How many other gamers are there in the room? Any other gamers, hardcore? No, that means okay. <laughs> or g just gamers, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Marginano. I am part of a company called Pop-Up Theatrics. Uh, I do immersive shows. Um, 
and most of them are really focused on social impact. So this is a subject that interests me a lot. And also a lot of my shows uh, tend to be journeys for audience members. For example, we did one in here uh, in Lower East Side about the life of residents. Um, and uh, most recently they tend to become, um, to take shape of games. So I was really interested to see what is this about. Hello, my name is Arya, and uh, my work is diff is completely independent. It's finance, but uh, I'm uh, fascinated by Tunnel Museum, and uh, I got the email saying that the topic is games and migration. And it sounded very fantastic to me. And uh, interestingly, recently my niece, uh, who is seven years old, was playing with a game that apparently was from. 7,000 years ago, it was the first game ever or something. So I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I guess it was a coincidence that uh, uh, matched these two. Uh, my name is Choi, I work in finance too. And the truth is he talk, took me here, uh, but I'm interested in games in general, so I just wanna see what's there. Uh, hi, I'm Sophia. I work as a product manager at a tech company, um, but the reason I'm here is because I have been working with a non-for-profit company as a side project to develop a card game, actually, that is focused on empathy and uh, building deeper human connection. Uh, so yeah, um, here try to see what uh, the community is doing, and uh, part of my background is actually game design uh, and the games for learning, so very interested to learn more. Hi, my name is Emma Butin. I work for the French Embassy, uh, and I'm an officer for TV, new media, VR, and uh, video games. And I just arrived in New York, so I'm, I'm really interested in knowing wha what you do. And before, I worked in a venue in Paris uh, dedicated to art and new technologies, but with um, w how uh, technology impacts our lives, so it was also <laughs> related to social impact, so I'm really interested in Hi, uh, my name's Alina. I'm uh, an artist. I got into game design about six years ago a lot due to Games for Change. Um, I was working in Europe. Um, I'm also, I guess, kind of a third generation migrant. In four or five generations in my family, we've been moving around all the time. And so I, I relate to that. And um, I'm very interested in bridging um, nonfiction and fiction through experiences that um, that people have and make together. Um, and I'm here uh, as a first year grad student from the NYU Game Center. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to, to see what's uh, going on here. I think you just found another alum in the room. <laughs> Sorry, what are we doing? Are we doing and what your connection to the, to the topic is. Uh, I am Loreen and I work at the Tenement Museum. Um, I, I guess I'm a hardcore gamer if you count my Scrabble and Backgammon app on my phone. So. <laughs> we do. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, I'm Garima. I work at the Tenement Museum as well. Um, I'm a NYU graduate. Um, I passed out earlier this year. And in some of the courses that I took had to do with like game theory and how we can bring in games into education. And that's why I'm here today. Hello, I'm Shruti. And, um, I'm actually just here because I'm Garima's friend. I arrived in New York today for a job, and uh, yeah, I still haven't slept. <laughs> welcome, welcome to New York. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia. I work here at the Tenement Museum, and I manage our K through 12 programs. So I'm looking for some inspiration on how we can use games in our programming here, both um, on site in our partnerships with schools, and maybe digitally. And uh, I also play a lot of backgammon on my phone. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> uh, my name is Melissa. I am also um, a part of the Tenement Museum. I am not a gamer at all, but I love stories. And obviously, um, games are magically imaginative with the stories that they tell. Um, so I'm interested how the, the content, you know, of, of migration and um, how that is created through um, gaming and the impact it has on this particular audience. 
Hi, um, my name is Senka, and I'm here with the International Rescue Committee, which is a large international uh, humanitarian organization that supports refugees and displaced people around the world. Um, and I'm also here as a member of the Refugee Voices um, initiative that we have as a former refugee. We are trying to get stories out um, and get people engaged in advocacy um, to support the resettle refugee resettlement program in the U.S. and beyond. Um, and so we're, ext I mean, I was in immediately interested in this topic, uh, but this is also something that we're interested in at the IRC um, to see if there are ways we can engage with the gaming community to get stories out, get people engaged, and support our broader work. Hi, I'm Vasudha. Um, I also work with Senka at the IRC. I think she did a good job of uh, <laughs> describing our interests. But yeah, I mean, the gaming community is massive and people are engaged um, in games, whether they're directly playing them or not. So uh, definitely interested in that and you know, leveraging the storytelling and just bringing attention to the migration crisis. I mean, it touches the entire world in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, currently, but also historically. Um, and yeah, the empathy piece is something that I'm really interested in because I see, you know, especially with the political climate in the US, um, that it's something to tap into. Great, thank you everyone. I think that was just helpful for us to kind of um, be able to have more of a thoughtful conversation with you. So um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Nick. Um, Take it away. Okay, uh, should we just, we'll just introduce each other ourselves quick, if that's cool. So I'm Nick Fortino, I'm a game designer, an interactive narrative designer, i co-founder of a company called Playmatics, and I've done game design for like 25 years or something like that. I'm Greg Jafry, I uh, am, uh, I, I guess, the partner at a studio called Gigantic Mechanic, and we make all sorts of uh, games, uh, everything from live action stuff to video games. I'm Bill Talley. I'm an educational media researcher who's worked for 35 years on games, um, studying how kids and teachers use them and learn with them. All very old. All right. Uh, Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, see? See? Energy. I told you. I'm going to keep it up. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to talk about this thing I worked on uh, called The Waiting Game, what eventually became called The Waiting Game. Uh, this is a project that I worked on with uh, ProPublica and Mount Sinai, Human Rights Watch, and WNYC. Uh, the origin of this project was that uh, the election happened in 2016, and I was very upset. And I was trying to think of what to do, and the people I knew in politics were not giving me good answers, except like, you should do something you know how to do, right? And so I was like, okay, well, I know how to make games and stories and stuff. So I'm gonna make a game or a story or something. And I had seen this video online about uh, Syrian, uh, the Syrian refugee experience. And what was interesting to me was something that rang true with my experience because I had, I, I've, I've been a teacher at, at the graduate school level for many, many years and I teach a number of international students. And, I, and what this video was really trying to impart to people was that coming into to the United States as a refugee takes a very long time, like years. And I knew this because I had students who came into the United States and it takes years. And everyone I knew who is involved in the field uh, was talking about some of the rhetoric that was used in the Republican Party during the election and how ridiculous it was to assume that people seeking asylum or refugee status would somehow be unvetted because it just takes so long to do it that there are much easier ways to get into the country if you wanted to do harm to the country. Um, and so I, I was really upset about this and I wanted to try to figure out a way to communicate this point because it seems so obvious to me that if it takes you four years to get into a country, that's not an efficient way of doing anything other than fleeing something you want to get away from. Um, and I had seen this, uh, 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 this data visualization called uh, If the Moon Were Only One Pixel. Um, I'm not gonna show a video of it because it would take too long, but essentially what it is is it's a representation of the solar system at, at, at accurate scale if the moon were one pixel on your screen. Um, and the way it works is that you can see it asks you to scroll to explore. So you basically just like scroll to the, you just keep scrolling to the right. And you start at the sun, which is scaled to the size where the moon is one pixel, and you just scroll through space to get to the next planet. So you scroll, swipe, 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 you hit Mercury, swipe, 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 you hit Venus, swipe, 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 you hit Earth and the moon, because they're very close. Uh, swipe, 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 you hit Mars. And if you know nothing about astronomy, which I effectively did, you assume you're gonna go swipe, 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 and hit Jupiter. That's not what happens, because Jupiter is 
way further away. It's further away than everything in the interior solar system is to each other. So you swipe, 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 swipe. And it's, I can't remember how many it is, but it's like over 60 swipes. And then you hit Jupiter. Now, <laughs> you can tell from what I just told you that I don't actually know how far Jupiter is from Mars, right? <laughs> but that's not really relevant because I now understand that a model of the solar system that's just like concentric circles that are equidistant from each other is completely wrong. And I will never not remember that. Because essentially what this piece did is it gave me what I would call an embodiment of space, right? I don't know how far away Mars is from Jupiter, but I know it's really far. And I know it's really far because I swiped a lot, <laughs> right? And so I have this embodiment of that. And so as I, I looked at this piece, I thought about it and I was like, well, what if the issue is essentially that people do not have an embodiment of time? Like maybe people are hearing two to four years and they don't think about what two to four years is. So if I gave someone an embodiment of time, right, that they would actually feel two years, maybe that would change the way they think about uh, refugees, right? Um, so I, just on a whim, I contacted my friend Cece Wei. This is, this is Cece Wei. She's an interactive journalist at ProPublica. I, I literally just know her because I've, I've, I'm very old and in the scene. Um, and I, I wrote her just to be like, hey, I'm going to work on this thing because I, because I, want to do some activism around this topic, but I don't want to do it if it's not true because it'll be too easy to shoot down. Can you tell me if this is journalistic? And then CC started asking me like, well, how much would it actually cost? How long would it actually take to do? And then that got a little bit more serious because ProPublica was, was kind of like rolling in rage donations. And so then they basically funded it and then it became a project with ProPublica. So that was cool. Um, <laughs> this is more about that. Um, I contacted my friend, Dr. Kim Baranowski, who works with the human rights program at Mount Sinai. She does, um, uh, like uh, uh, there's an interview process you go through when you get asylum where you get, you have to go through a psychological um, examination to demonstrate uh, like the trauma that you experienced. It's part of the asylum process and so she conducts those interviews. So I brought her in as an expert to kind of give us these stories. This is when the game ceased to be about Syria by the way because Syrian refugees don't generally come to the United States. They mostly immigrate to Europe. Most uh, asylum seekers in the United States come from Central and South America, fleeing gang, domestic, and sexual violence. And a lot of LGBTQ um, asylum seekers as well. Uh, and so uh, uh, Dr. Baranowski provided, she's a friend of mine, so I'm gonna keep saying Kim by accident. Dr. Baranowski uh, provided the, um, the stories that we used um, in, in the game, and CC conducted the investigative journalism piece of this because this be eventually became a journalistic project. Um, so basically, the way it works is that there are five stories that each relate to the five ways one can get asylum in the country. Asylum, uh, in the, I mean, many of you probably know this already, but just to give you the shorthand, asylum was something that, that came into presence after World War II and the rejection of the Jewish diaspora that happened was a kind of a horror that the world witnessed later on. And then it was sort of loosely existed without laws and then it was codified much later. And when it was codified, the law covered, um, let me get it right because I, I always forget all of them, race, ethnicity, um, political affiliation, association with a social group, and religion. Um, there are very obvious absent ones there, by the way, like gender. I didn't say gender because gender. You're being discriminated against. For those. Home, home country, yes. Those are the reasons why you can seek asylum. Now you'll notice gender is not on there. Gender is typically associated, typically categorized under social group. Um, so also LGBT, LGBTQ identities are, are typically characterized under social group and that's how they can apply for asylum. Um, so you pick one story that relates to one of those topics from different parts of the world and they're sort of proportionally driven by um, where people come to the United States from, which is uh, Central and South America, some African, some um, East, Easter, East Asian, like Tibetan uh, uh, asylum seekers. And then you play through basically a narrative that looks like this um, with one screen for every day of the life of the asylum seeker recovering from the moment they decide to seek asylum in the United States to the moment their asylum case is decided. A day looks like this. It's a picture. It's a little bit of text, uh, and then two buttons at the bottom. You can keep going or you can give up. That's all the interactivity in the system. That's like literally all you do. Now, 
Um, you'll notice there's no, uh, there's no meter on the screen. There's no indication of how far you are in the experience. We never actually tell you where you are in the experience. So when you start the experience, you just start the day. There are scenes that are locked scenes that happen every time you play that story. Those relate to like very important biographic moments in the person's life, the act of violence that caused them to seek asylum, the moment they actually crossed into the country, um, the moment of the asylum trials or the asylum hearings they have, all that stuff is locked. All the other days are procedurally generated because basically nothing happens. Um, you're, you know, it's not like a, it's not a calm game. The reviews of this game called it the first game of existential dread, which I was quite proud of in my perverse way. Um, but like you get content like this, right? Which is like thinking about where you are. In this case, you are, this character is still in the Congo, has not left yet, but is hiding. And so you are basically hiding in this house for an amount of time. But as I said, um, these asylum cases are typical asylum cases, so they tend to take two to five years to resolve. And two to five years, if you looked at every day, is somewhere between 700 and uh, 1,500 days or more, 1,800. Um, the longest story is over 2,000 days, and that every day is a click. That means to get through the story, you have to click 1,500 times. Uh, no one does that. Right, and we knew that. I knew that went from the from the original idea of this piece. I knew no one would do that. I knew you would quit. Um, people tend to quit. Yeah, they don't get the Pluto either. Exactly, right? Like, because it's not the point, right? So, so people tend to quit a little bit over 100, which was higher actually than I thought they would get. Um, I thought they'd wipe out around 50, um, but they tend to get to around 100 on average. But when you quit, the site captures you and it shows you this screen, right? This is how many days you made it. This is how many average play, every days a player makes it. This is how long the story can last. And what you experience is based on the story of a real person, a man from Bangladesh. He and his family waited around six years or around 2,190 days, this is the longest one, uh, to get asylum. And so the idea, the central idea, is that you just click through 40 days. Each day takes about 30 seconds because the buttons don't appear right away. So that means if you clicked about 40 times, you did this thing for about 20 minutes before you gave up. Right? So when, we, when you give up, we show you this screen. And we say, by the way, that thing that you did 40 times, this person did over 2,000 times. And the thing that took you 30 seconds actually took them 24 hours. And the idea is that by pushing you to quit, by like making you experience that, that, that the pain of waiting through that stressful situation, you would have an embodied sensation of the time it takes and recognize that that little fraction that you experienced is just a tiny fraction of the actual experience that asylum seekers have. Um, and the game was hosted on the ProPublica site um, with reporting, which I'm very proud to say was sort of inspired by the game about how the asylum system works and doesn't work in a really beautiful piece uh, by WNYC, who was just brought on to do the sound, and then they got interested, and they did a story about what happens to asylum seekers when they are released from detention centers, which is nothing. They basically just fight, sign your forms and drop you in the parking lot, and about a, a church group that picks people up and then bring, this is in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and then brings them to social services. So um, the game became part of a much larger package of um, content around that topic. Yep, that's me. Uh, so we worked on a, a couple years ago. We worked on a game called the uh, Gigantic Mechanic. We worked on a game called The Migrant Trail, with uh, the documentary filmmaker Marco Williams. He uh, made a documentary uh, called the, um, the Undocumented, uh, and was interested in making uh, was like a you know it was going to be on PBS and wanted to make a game uh, for it that went along with it that uh, kind of maybe reached a different audience than uh, the television audience and um, kind of, I think for, for a lot of the reason a lot of us were interested in games, it's like, oh, the, the, the kids like them. Um, how, do we get the, how do we get them interested? Um, and so we worked on this game with him and it's, uh, and, and use a lot of the footage from his game. And uh, when we were talking about it, we, were, we talked a lot about like uh, how we were, like this is gonna be a game that you're gonna play on the web. So we immediately started thinking like, well, how, where are people gonna encounter this? Uh, how long are they gonna play it? Uh, um, who's that, who are those people gonna be? So, you know, our rules of thumb for a lot of that is like, uh, 
very, not very long, not uh, like maybe like 30 seconds uh, they'll give you. Um, uh, it's going to be like uh, kids. Um, they're going to play it for a couple minutes. If they don't succeed right away, they're going to on to something else. There's a lot that you're competing with. Um, and so you have to kind of grab their attention really quick and hopefully hold it for a little bit longer um, and keep delivering small little um, bits of information. Um, but overall, told, we figure we could probably get like, I don't know, yeah, five to ten minutes out of them if we were, or maybe 20. I mean, that's impressive. For um, something on the internet, <laughs> astounding. Um, uh, and so uh, this game, uh, we wanted to, and so, and to do that, we talked a lot with Marco about uh, how do we deliver something which really gets it like one thing, um, rather than like kind of recreating his documentary, like how do we make something kind of like Nick was saying about like an, uh, that delivers one experience. And so uh, we were really just, his documentary is really just about migrants crossing the, de the Sonoran Desert into the United States and what a grueling journey that is. Um, and, uh, and so we were like, let's make a game about how you essentially dehydrate to death. Um, uh, or kind of, a, it's just, you're just walking and uh, you can take more water, but it's just heavier, so you just go slower. Um, and so essentially that's what it's about. Uh, you, uh, in the beginning, um, uh, you're introduced to uh, a host of different migrants. These were all taken from stories um, that he had collected uh, while making the documentary. And then we used footage that he'd shot, like kind of B-roll footage in some of the, the scenes. Um, and at the beginning, you, uh, you pick out uh, the stuff you're going to take with you. Um, and uh, it has a, and for this we were like, let's borrow from the, a classic American game about uh, Journeys Westward. Um, so we basically ape the mechanics of Oregon Trail, uh, and uh, where you kind of just get a bunch of uh, stuff, and then you go on a really um, like hard, impossible journey. Um, and so we thought, like, let's pe people are familiar with that. Let's kind of borrow that. Um, uh, and so uh, in the game, you you collect your stuff, then you go on your journey, and uh, and you usually lose. Um, especially, and again, because we thought, uh, and it, the game's like. So punishingly hard, um, especially the first one, because we were, all, we were thinking like no one's going to stick around to play all nine of these characters. So we got to hit you with our main message up front, which is that it's really hard and sometimes people die. Um, so the first one, people get stuck on the first character all the time. They're like, I can't get past it. And well, actually, you, actually, what happens is you you play that character, he dies, and then uh, and then you move on to the next person. You can't re replay him. Um, and so. Uh, Again, we were just trying to ring one note. Like we always think of with games like this, like how do we have like one note and have, like and then sound that really um, strongly. Um, uh, and one of the other things that Marco wanted to do was also to make this a balanced thing, so you can play as both a migrant or play as the border patrol as well um, in this game. So uh, there's a second mode of gameplay uh, in which you play. Um, similarly, like you're introduced to several people who work in Border Patrol, and he'd spent a lot of time with them, so we um, built characters out around them as well. And uh, and then you play uh, someone who's just sort of searching through very large swaths of empty land, um, and occasionally you come across you come across artifacts of people that have been out there, or um, and sometimes you come across migrant parties, and then you have choices about how do you, what do you do? Um, provide aid? Do you provide aid there? Do you take them? Uh, take them back to uh, to like a hospital um, to get it. And so we were trying to humanize sort of both sides of the story. We wanted um, people to understand that there was sort of uh, um, uh, two sides of the story. And one of the things that uh, came out of this, so then after that we did, uh, we worked with the Institute of Play. They did some uh, evaluation on it, um, had watched kids play it, uh, and um, then had them fill out forms like this. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in this part, I found really interesting and totally disturbing because um, uh, people would play it and they would be like, oh, did you, like I was looking at this form the other day, like looking for images for this mm -hmm. slideshow. And I love it, or I don't love it at actually at all. Right. But it's like, did you leave someone behind? Yes. How did it make you feel? Just fine. Um, uh, and in that, like, le and the, this is like, this is the experience of making this game and other video games is like, over time has led me to this sort of feeling that like, Games kind of make you into a, like a, a sociopath at best, maybe like a verging on psychopath. Uh, you because you kind of like learn how to win them, right? Like it's like a, how do I do this thing? And like this guy was like the best way to get across the desert was just leave people behind. Because um, if you uh, if you help them, then uh, you slow down, you have less stuff, and so um, we we're trying to make that point. But it, uh, people's behavior tends to be like. I want to win this thing. You told me to win this thing. You told me to get across the desert. I'm going to do that. And then they like say, I feel just fine. You're like, ah, empathy. Um, 
and uh, and so and I, th I think that's true um, in some ways uh, because uh, when we play video games, it's sort of like doing stuff on the internet when you're writing comments on Twitter. Um, and so uh, uh, people kind of you're doing it in this very disembodied way. And so that's let a, um, and not the people that don't feel bad like these kids like they would do they would make others they did some other design tasks and they would show real understanding of it and. Um, in talking with some teachers that had used this game, they actually got really great things out of it when they would like talk to their students, have them do uh, some uh, work. This guy, Matt Farber, uh, would use the game uh, as a way to talk about the refugee crisis in Europe um, and, uh, and, and get them to kind of start to making up their own stories. Like, is this, it's a prod um, for something. And that's something that we've like, been, like, become more and more serious about, that games are just prods, right? They're like, that like they teach you something, kind of how to be a, a psycho that wins something, and then um, it's up to the educators to say, take that and then like do something with it, like ask the right question that scaffolds it. Um, and so the work we've done, um, a lot of the work we've done since then, uh, we've I've like been, we've been focused very much on how do we put games in situations where you can't quite act like that. Um, you can't be like just uh, oh it's just, it's on the computer and no one's watching me do this, watching me like leave these people behind. Um, so we did, we've done a lot of live action um, uh, work. And so this is a project we've been doing for the last uh, year or so called uh, A More Perfect Union, uh, where uh, it's historical role playing simulations and they're done in classrooms. You're given a character you have to play um, and you're introduced to a, sub, like a topic. Uh, so this one's about Shay's Rebellion. Um, and then you've got to like go and talk to people and if you act like an a-hole um, to them, like they're in your class. And so what takes over in those cases is a whole lot of like really great social behavior um, that really starts to guide uh, people's behavior. And then I think actually like becomes even bigger prod to, um, to understanding and empathy because um, you see how people are reacting to you. And in this game, in these games, uh, we did, this one's about Shay's Rebellion, which is around the time of the Constitutional Convention. We just did a uh, play tested one two days ago about nullification in South Carolina. Um, and that's like a really difficult topic about slavery and, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and the, in tariffs and stuff like that. Uh, but people are able to, you know, these New York City school kids are able to take on those roles, do like the historical thinking that's involved in it. Um, and, then, uh, and then out of that, like the best part of it is not so much them playing it, because, you know, watching them have to like, you know, uh, here's the, the, the South Carolina plantation owner's version of why this is good is at the end is that question of like, wh how, what does this relate to now? And like this one woman at the end, she's like, this reminds me a lot of like jailing refugees and stuff like that. Or, uh, you know, we did the Shays one, uh, somebody had uh, pointed out, uh, somebody in from, uh, had played at New Jersey, was like, this is a lot like uh, what's going on in Georgia right now where people are being disenfranchised. So it's like, again, it's that question out of it, which is like the really important thing. Like, how do you give them an experience which then gives you the fodder to ask something really interesting and make them make the connection, make that leap out of what they've done into something else. Great. Wow. Uh, sure. So that was a that was a great. I love coming after these two guys, um, even though it's hard. Um, so uh, just causes me to think that you know we sort of think about games as creating opportunities for situated learning, right? Like you know, like like we can't take students back in time. We can't take them, you know, into the desert. So we create these conditions in which students can can essentially construct knowledge by in a situation, but. What you're, the point you're making is that they're, maybe they're most powerful when we put games, the games themselves back in a situation that's a social situation in which there are learners who are transforming that knowledge and that experience and that data with others, which, yeah. so that's really cool. <clears throat> I guess I go forward with this. Can't, can't, wait, can't wait to see that stuff. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm a researcher, and so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the way we've done some research, my colleagues and I, at the uh, Education Development Center's Center for Children and Technology here in the West Village. Um, how we've done work over 10 years with a, with a really great group of designers and, re and historians and, uh, and history educators, creating a series of games that are about U US history and take students on sort of, um, first-person adventures through key episodes in, Ameri in the American past. They're classroom games, so to your point, they're really designed to be the sort of centerpiece of a classroom experience that's much richer than the game overall. So um, I'll just, do we have a video we can play? Yeah. 
this will be much better than me talking is just watch two minutes of kids kids using it. You'll see a you'll see a location a you might recognize. Online games designed to immerse young people in American history. Mission US allows students to engage in online games and online games In this mission, we hope to deepen students' understanding of the Ellis Island era of immigration. Isaac says New York is full of great opportunities. Students play Lena Brodsky, a Russian Jewish immigrant who comes to New York City in 1907 and is swept up in the growing labor movement. Was Lena on her own at the time? With students that are diverse learners and they have diverse backgrounds, I mean, you can find different resources and different avenues for the students to really get into the material. Some of them are great visual learners, some can't read very well. And by playing the games from the beginning to the end, everyone is able to bring something to our class that probably from a textbook they would miss. On the back of your paper is your first diary entry as Lena. The website provides a variety of activities to accompany each part of the game, including review questions, document-based activities, vocabulary activities, and writing prompts. By going deep into the content, students are gaining critical comprehension, writing, and analytical skills they need for mandated assessments. I like the game because it's like you're under the skin of that person and you're living those memories. Mission US truly allows students to become a part of the history. For a teacher, you can't hope for better than that. So that immigration game actually features the Tenement Museum as a key location, and it was worked on by Tenement Museum staff who helped create the curricular surround for the game. Um, so um, there are, f it's designed, as, as it says, for, for educators and, and their students, um, middle and, and upper elementary to lower high school, really. And there's about, you know, over three million users, and it's, and it's grown over um, about eight or nine years. Um, there are five missions, and this being U.S. history, the themes of migration, immigration, and even forced migration are threaded throughout. You can't teach American history without that being a key, a key piece. So um, there's stuff on, um, you know, enslaved people's experience trying to resist the slave system on a Cheyenne boy and his family trying to deal with um, forced displacement from their, from their lands due to Western settlement. And then the immigration story, which we talked on. The next one um, that's being worked on right now um, was funded in part by the National Park Service. And um, it's all about the experience of Japanese, uh, Americans of Japanese descent being um, relocated by force from their homes on the West Coast to, uh, to internment camps. Um, so um, that's a recurring theme and, and uh, you know, I'll just quickly tell you about some of the work that we do um, as researchers so you can kind of have a little bit of that context. Um, each game has basically three types of research that go along with it that we do. So prior to the game, um, there's being developed, there's teacher focus groups and think alouds we do with kids. And these really are meant to uh, drive the learning goals of the game. So we, we actually f try to figure out where, where in the curriculum is this going to fit, what do teachers really need, and what misconceptions do, do kids have, what, what confusions emotionally and otherwise are really at stake with these issues. And then we feed that to the designers and they take that into account. Um, then during game design and production, we play test the games and we're looking at appeal and usability, but also comprehension. Do they really grasp some of the underlying concepts that are really important. Um, and we do that with small groups of kids and in, in, in uh, after school settings and so on. Um, finally, with a completed game, when we have the, the uh, funding, we'll do comparison group tests between classrooms that are using the game to teach the content and also matched classrooms that are teaching that same content with sort of business as usual materials. And we'll have, depending on funding, between four and 50 classrooms involved in those studies. And we use pre and post tests to look at changes in th um, and improvement in three things. Historical content knowledge, um, which is important. Um, 
historical thinking and perspective taking. That's sort of the closest thing that gets to what we're calling empathy here. And we're really looking at it from a sort of historical literacy perspective. Are students able to um, look, we measure it by actually having them look at document-based um, uh, historical documents, which are often featured in the games because we want students using those outside. And we're trying to see, are they able to read and understand that those are from human perspectives and, and be able to you know, essentially analyze and interpret that, that document um, with, an, with an understanding of the historical perspective. Um, so that's, uh, I think that may be enough. I'm happy to talk a lot more about sort of, for example, in this game, Prisoner in My Homeland, what some of the goals are and what we've been finding out about in our research about that. But um, I think I'll just pause there because I know time is probably moving on, no? Sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. That was um, hopefully a deep dive for you guys on um, really just a, a better understanding of some of the games out there um, that are at this intersection. Um, I did want to at least talk a little bit about impact and maybe how, um, if we could at least for you to talk a little bit, and I don't know if you uh, um, want to talk about in the game how you are um, looking at measuring impact, what areas of impact are hard or or are there certain challenges to sort of, you know, looking at how this is successful and and maybe to piggyback on that too, just talking a little bit about um, um, some other um, maybe key partners in some of this work that would be important to um, maybe impact or scaling or just kind of leave it at that. Me first? Sure. Um, all right. So. Waiting game was interesting because it wasn't an educational game, right? It was a journalistic game, right? Which is mm -hmm. different, right? And so, um, so to ProPublica, impact means meant literally like will you know ProPublica is an investigative journalism agent, uh, a group that's aimed at at policy change and activism, right? Like this is like if you don't follow ProPublica, this is very explicit, right? Like they 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 understand what they do as trying to shape public policy through journalism. So their goal was to change immigration policy. Um, two things happened sort of as a result. We, we won some awards for it, which was cool, and, uh, and we got really good reviews in the press around it in terms of people playing it. ProPublica was sort of mixed about the game's impact. Um, on the one hand, we had much longer time on site. We saw a much larger um, reading of the articles and the, and the um, and the and the and the news story based on the on the on the sort of just analytics of the site, they saw much more engagement with all the content pieces, but they couldn't really. Part of it was that ProPublica wasn't quite sure how to market it to get it out, but part of it also wasn't really clear if this um, if this was actually reaching people who might not already be on the side of asylum law of, of like the, the asylum laws we have. And so it wasn't, they, they were sort of mixed about it. They were like, they were happy they did it and it definitely got attention and it definitely drove attention to the reading, but it wasn't totally clear that it accomplished their mission. And the other thing is that shortly thereafter, ProPublica broke a bunch of stories about how the US keeps kids in cages and that just sort of like obliterated the conversation about um, asylum seeking, like that, that was we were having before that point. Right. So that, that wasn't like, not that I'm upset, I'm actually right. very happy that my game was overshadowed by a much more serious ethical issue in the country and that ProPublica focused attention there. But it's not, we're not totally sure what would have happened if that, if that had not been discovered when it was. Right, so that, so that seems to me, that's a question of sort of audience, how you reach the audience and what is possible with an audience that may be different than Could you use your mic? Oh, sorry. Um, I just, it's interesting to me that, you know, how the game gets out there and to whom uh, it interacts with its goals and whether those goals will be successful or not, right? You know, and, and um, so chances are people picked up Waiting Game because they were in the, in the channels that ProPublica and journalists, people would, go to it because they were interested in the topic, probably because they were on the left-hand side of that topic, I would imagine, right? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. we got I think we got two kinds of people. We got people who are already interested in the topic. Mm -hmm. Well, three kinds. The people who were already interested in the topic and were sort of focused on it. We got people who were in that world of like looking at journalism as a way to do activism and didn't necessarily know anything about asylum, but hit it. Mm -hmm. And then I think we did get a number of people interested in sort of interesting web experiments. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. just because it was a, yeah. such a weird, dark experience. I think people kind of like wanted to go to it and see it. And I was hoping for more of that. And I think that's probably not, I'm not I mean, ProPublica was an amazing partner and CC is brilliant. So like, this is not a criticism of them, but I think none of us quite knew like, how do we tap more of that audience? But that's why the awards were kind of cool because the awards were infographic awards. Yeah. And so like, like if infographic awards are looking at what we're doing, that's really good. Because that means people who have no interest in asylum or immigration law yeah. at all are starting to look at this experience and they get access to it. And turning to Greg's point before, um, it's much less like you play the game and then suddenly you you are now, you know, you are now like a like a like a, like a human rights activist tomorrow. It's more that like the, the intention of the game with the reporting was essentially like, this will give you an embodied experience of something that when you read the ProPublica content, you will approach it differently. Because now you actually have some emotional um, experience that you can tie to right. these things. So if you read about someone in a detention center and you actually, you actually role played spending time in a detention center, you don't have the experience of being in a detention center, but you have this aspect of it. Right. And that will inform what you did. So in, in research terms, that's a question of game plus. Game plus journalistic, you know, material afterwards is probably the powerful combination, right? Whereas uh, you can imagine somebody creating a nice little um, survey that they people could take right before they play the game and say about how desperate a problem do you think you know asylum seeking is, you know, and now tell us after the game. But I think more interesting is how does it drive them to learn to want to know more and what? How do they have a richer map of what the whole problem is afterwards? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, we've, uh, we always think about, I mean, it, it's oh, impact, uh, the, cause we've done lots of projects where we try and measure it and, um, and it's always hard. Um, and so, uh, you, you do the surveys and the forms and then you realize like they, they feel one way now and 15 minutes later they may feel something, you know, so you're always thinking like if I was going to really change behavior, change people's minds. I have to interact a bunch of times with them, um, and that's not happening with this web game. Um, uh, but and so, uh, so we're you know there's like a, so sometimes you know and this, so as a game designer sometimes you look for like where is the win that I can see you know like uh, when I'm like play testing something and I think we you know. Uh, you, you can kind of see like, oh, is someone, how are people reacting to this? Is this like, is this speaking to them? Is it not? Are they bored? Um, and I think a lot of that is actually really valuable information. Um, it doesn't necessarily translate into um, uh, academically provable anything. Um, but, uh, and then, uh, and then, and then again, and with like, uh, with all the projects, so like I was pointing to that question there, like, which uh, that came out of Migrant Trail, um, where someone like, you know, did it and they answered this, fill out the survey and you're like, that's not the impact I was hoping for. But what it was, was like going to something a couple years later uh, after we had like forgotten about the game. Like we made it and you're on to doing something else and hearing Matt talk about it at Games for Change and saying like, oh yeah, I was been using this in my classroom and being like, oh, that's amazing. Like this thing, uh, someone picked this up and uses it as a tool for something. And that's, that actually kind of reframed my thinking about a lot of these things is that kind of to your point is that like the game plus like um and so we started thinking about the stuff we were making a lot more as like how do we give like uh, educators tools to do stuff um that they can uh they that they're going to interact with the people on a daily basis and have a real impact um because i'm just touching you at, like one little moment you know uh and i'm not gonna necessarily do that but if i give someone a, gr a teacher a great tool to do something they can have an amazingly big impact um and so like that's like very much informed like the thinking of the a more perfect union project where it's like how do we create like a bunch of role plays that teachers could go back to over and over again throughout the year and then they use those for their questions yeah. right and um and so uh and there when you ask questions that they're like you, you like for me, it's always like that. You get that valuable moment where you ask them, like, "What do you? Does this make you think differently?" And you're like, well, I kind of understand that person's perspective a little better. I don't like it, but I kind of understand. It. I'm like, that's the impact I was hoping for. So awesome. You know, the 1970s were this period of amazing, like affluence. Or whatever, I got that word wrong, but um, flowering of 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 interactive games that were paper and card based games um, for in classrooms, mm -hmm. role playing games. Um, the company uh, that I work for, EDC in Massachusetts, created this thing called Subject to Citizen that still you can find teachers that are using this paper and cardboard thing all about the transformation of, from the um, mercantile system in the Atlantic with slaves and rum to, um, you know, kind of a, the, the revolution uh, period. Really rich, rich game that 
that really put kids in places where they were making decisions and, and dealing with trade and consequences um, face to face and in groups um, and doing research on cards and doing and, and moving around about so the way that you're using the medium to essentially I mean with a mobile medium the power the the more effective way you can actually give kids impactful ex information about their roles about their interests and have them do those negotiations I think is yeah. is really great and I think that kind of simulation based live simulation based learning is, is super powerful mm -hmm. so I think it's great you're doing that yeah. and I I didn't mean to leave you out of the impact. I thought you sort of already touched on it, but if no. you had anything else that you wanted to well, talk I mean, on, I'd... there's so many rich things to talk about. I think you touched on how uh, games, the very nature of games can sort of, um, in some possible, it's very easy because they, if they have a win state, an end state, um, it runs the risk when you're dealing with these really difficult social history problems of enslavement and, you know, forced, displacement of, of peoples, the native peoples and so on. Um, you're, you are giving students a, ch an, a, a goal and, so, and a way to get through to them. So how, like we had a game on enslavement. So a young 14 year old uh, African American girl is trying to move from Kentucky plantation to Ohio. And we grapple with this thing, this the same question, like fact is, you know, uh, everybody wants to get across, and they're going to try, and we're throwing up obstacles, and they're going to try. So it's a little, it's very much like the migrant tarot game. Um, you have to frustrate, in order to be historically accurate, you have to frustrate that, that desire, desire and, and hopefully you're doing it in ways that illuminate ways in which the slave system is operating, because they keep coming up against these systemic, you know, um, barriers of slave patrols and, and all kinds of stuff, um, passes and literacy issues. and. Um, but um, so it, the fact is very, very few slaves compared to the numbers that there were escaped and even fewer succeeded. So you cannot misrepresent if, if you simply say, like my ingenuity got me, got me through. You're misrepresenting, you're allowing students to have a false understanding of the, of the experience in the slave system. So you ha as a game creator, you have to, um, you have to, be very careful about how you structure that. And it really, it means that there the shift, the cognitive shift is between where kids are naturally, middle school kids are, they believe history was a matter of outsmarting the circumstances. They've, their whole entire life they've lived with parents who've taken care of things for them. In most cases, obviously not all, um, migrant kids and, and refugees in particular, but for the most part, they have a highly naive sense of how you overcome obstacles. So to, to complicate that, you're constantly, as a game maker, it's ironic, you're complicating that. You're creating not just game barriers to success, but social constraints, racism, you know, um, discrimination, all kinds of things that students have to come ha somehow um, understand as constitutive of people's experience and identify that when they might not be ready to do that at the start. So that's the role we see teachers telling us the gate they want this game, these games to play. There, in this country right now, it's so divided that, you know, when I interview teachers at the very beginning, talk to them about the way they want to teach about Japanese incarceration, they say, look, um, I, I talk to folks who are all over the country, get them in these online focus groups, and it's very different depending on where they are. They, it's hard history. Japanese incarceration, how do you teach about it? And they really look to the game for help, but the kind of help they need differs depending on where they are. So in, in upper Midwest and white schools with, that are pretty well healed, students there, they th see the history as very remote. It's maybe a one-off experience. It doesn't have much relevance for today. And frankly, they think, you know, if they were incarcerated, there was probably a good reason. It's very hard for them to imagine that the, the UI, those kids to imagine that the U.S. could have done something so seemingly arbitrary, right? So they'll think their suspicion: oh, it was wartime. They're Japanese. Maybe they were spies. It was good, good idea. Okay. So that's one set of problems. How do you help those kids understand this situation? On the other hand, there's kids with schools with lots of immigrants, where the teachers are basically saying, "I have to be tread very carefully because." My students are deeply afraid for themselves and their own families, given where we are right now. This history could be very alarming. How do you deal with that? Um, 
And then the, the tendency of, of kids to think in black and white, to, to, to think either, you know, it's probably something that wasn't that bad, or else, oh my God, this just goes to show you how evil America is. <laughs> so the, the challenge is always to give teachers a, a, an anchor, an experiential anchor that engages students in the time and in the dilemmas faced by the individuals suffering, and then to, to foster a discussion and, and a rich conversation through writing and through conversation, through debates, about the views and the values taken in the game and which ones you identify with, always re referencing the larger historical context. So what is this, this you know, um, order 9066, which Roosevelt signed, that, that uh, incarcerated the Japanese? Why was that done? How is it constitutional? How was it not? What are the debates? So students really need a layered experience of the past. They, that's why I, I, I kind of agree with you, games themselves um, do really well the kinds of things that you, you're the waiting game um, a, accomplished. Um, they don't help you achieve this layered understanding in which your own first, first order inferences and gut feelings and, uh, and analyses get challenged and then get transformed. And that happens with game plus. And we see this in our, in our work. Yeah. yeah, I mean games, I, I think games are not like it's a, it's interesting because right like because like new media come up and then they become panacea right and so like VR is the panacea right now like well like all we have to do is get headsets into every school and then then children will know every experience on the face of the earth right and and I won't I won't derail this into like why VR is like as stupid as every other new medium is stupid <laughs> but um, but essentially it's like they're good for certain things right like the games are good at certain things and I agree uh, essentially that games punch games punch really well because they they get you to I, I mean, in that, in that Trump doy sense of, right, like, you look at something and you're like, whoa, whoa yeah. right? Like, you get that kind of reaction because they let you embody the thing you're doing, right? And so it's, it's a very personal relationship you have to something. It's very good at teaching certain kinds of things, like teaching systems. It's incredible at teaching systems. I think it's better at teaching systems than anything on the face of the earth because you will actually engage with a system. Like if I shoot, if I, if I do a movie around the banking crisis, it's really hard to tell that story about like the derivatives market and trading and, and, and bad loans. Cause it's like, it's complicated and messy and there's all this stuff in it, right? But if I make you a trader, like I give you like, here, here you go, here's the economy, make money, hit this percentage or you'll get fired, it's automatic. You understand it automatically. But what you don't do is you don't critically understand it. You, un you embodiedly understand it. So when someone stops and says, okay, now we're gonna talk about what the derivative market is, you say, oh, right, yeah, that was that thing where like, like we were trading all that stuff that was totally worthless and gonna crash, but it made a lot of money, yeah. right? And you don't even have the language for it exactly. Like I, I ta often talk about it, like one of the, the most effective educational games I played when I was a kid was uh, Sid Meier's Pirates. Um, which is a game about being a pirate in the Caribbean. And I learned the geography of the Caribbean because I sailed it a ton, <laughs> right? And so I went back and forth and I learned about what trade winds were. And I know, I know how you want to go from east to west and west to east and how you have to cut your ship to be able to sail against the wind. Like I know all that stuff because like I did it. Like I, I, I didn't think about it. It's not like I ever really, like I didn't sit down and, and draw a map of the Caribbean, right? Because like that game didn't ask me to do that. And why would I? It has nothing to do with winning. But I, I definitely understood it. So if someone had stopped me and said like, hey, talk about why you think trade worked the way it did in the Caribbean. Let's just like, like I'm just gonna offer you a question, right? Why do you think this city was a really big port? I could probably answer that question if you prompted me because I would be like, yeah, why did I keep going there? Oh, because it was really close to these places and the trade winds led me right there. And then I could get to Florida really fast. Oh yeah, it makes, it makes perfect sense. Like that's why. And so when people start talking about it, it makes sense. And I think that like context that, I think games work really nicely in that context. Whereas like a lot of linear storytelling forms are really good at, um, at identifying characters and then building simple narratives that, that become like very catchy that you can hold on to, that you can, you can like directly empathize with. Games tend to work more by basically giving you a bunch of tools and letting you play, and then just giving you this sort of very like intuitive gut understanding of the thing you did, 
And that's why, and, and there's like research that backs this up, like a lot of uh, academic research around games and education back this up, that like, then when you ask a player like, hey, why did you do what you did? Um, that leads to like very profound learning. Because then they are associating it with something they, they intuitively understand, not just something that they're, they're kind of cerebrally understanding. And so I do a lot of this kind of stuff with education or with documentaries and I, I, I'm always trying to convince people like, if this game is going to exist as part of like this educational ecosystem of right, you're gonna have a game and you're gonna talk about it, do the game as the very first thing. Mm -hmm. Like put the game right up front. Because like what you want is to carry the, you wanna give them this emotional understanding that they carry with them through the content because it makes the content real. I'm imagining this like nullification stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like it's gotta be like, some of that terror stuff's gotta be dry as hell mm -hmm. if you're like 15, but if you fought over it, mm -hmm. Right now, when you're when you hear that conversation, you're like, "Oh, I remember that because that was the side of that person who I was trying to beat, and that was miserable." Right. right? And so, like that that stuff like creates um, it creates connection to material that I think is really valuable. That when you do it in reverse, it's a little bit weird, right? Because right? then because then you're just learning the stuff in this way that you don't have a direct connection to, and then you get connected to it afterwards. I think is kind of a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But could you understand a process better? If, you, if it was iterative and, and like that's the, what the classroom games sort of with mobile technology is going in phases. So there's a, there's a historical process that, of, of something that happened over time that you want to unfold, you know, understand to unfold. That, that's, that's another, you know, interesting wrinkle on the, the, the time. Yeah, and it's not, it's not like a one formula. I totally agree, it's not a one formula thing. It's all, it, you know, first of all, everything in schools in the United States is like hyper localized, right? Like to the teacher. And so when, I don't know if you ha do this too, but when I make educational games, I always make them so you can hack them into tiny little pieces and spread them out because I don't know what a teacher's gonna do. So I'm just like, hmm. here is a buffet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like take the pieces that are useful to you. Um, but I also think that it's like, it, you know, like if we're gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a little ranty, but like, if we're gonna treat education seriously, we have to just recognize that, like, yeah, it's not th th there is not one way of teaching everything, right? We we actually have to get into the nuts and bolts of like, okay, what is the thing we're trying to 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 develop? Does it require like multiple re re repetitious encounters? Mm -hmm. Is it something that one punch could actually mm -hmm. communicate in an effective way? And where would that punch be valuable? Right. And like. You know, yeah. video's still cool. Like, yeah. videos in classrooms, yeah. still really great. Yeah. So, like, yeah. we should use those, too. Yeah. And I think all that stuff comes into a handshake. And, and, and again, and, and I, I, won't, I'll, I swear I'll stop after this, but you can also go very wrong with games, just like you can go very wrong with any medium. And there's a very famous game called Spent, which is a game trying to teach people about poverty that actually, mm -hmm. because of its design, taught people that poverty was something you could win if you were just smart which is exactly the wrong lesson about poverty. It's like, like literally the one thing you do not want people to think about poverty. Um, but it was because of the way the mechanic worked. It wasn't because you can't make a game about poverty. Mm -hmm. like, like, like I have made games about poverty that were successfully depicting poverty. It's that you have to be very careful in the interactive aesthetics to make sure that like, if you have things like goals, if you have things like winning conditions, if you have things like constraints, that they are all aimed at building a message that the game is trying to build or teaching the lesson the game is trying to teach. Because if you don't pay a lot of attention to that, it is quite easy, even for experienced game designers, to miss completely. Yeah, I mean, if, if, when, you'd, uh, when you were talking about uh, the systemic, uh, systemic learning um, part of games earlier, I was just thinking about spent. Because, uh, I mean, like, it's true, like, uh, games, yeah, they, like, games like Civ or pirates like do they teach you like a systemic thing and it felt like what spent was trying to do was like teach you empathy they gave you a systemic system which you could beat um and uh so you're like oh i have to solve the system right. um so <laughs> it like uh it yeah it's in right. um in many ways and like what and this kind of goes back to saying you were saying earlier, but it was like it was this weird feeling of like sometimes you have to like, kind of rig them a little bit like that like migrant trail that when i said earlier that that first level you you lose over and over again it's totally rigged it's like uh, not you know it's like uh it's it's um it would be statistically uh, it's like uh we we make it much harder than it actually is uh -huh. Uh -huh. just because we have to we want we, we were trying to convey a certain empathetic point right. at that point and we want you to feel that um uh more than have a systemic understanding of something right. um and so uh as a designer yeah. you're you know I mean, you're kind of treading 
was tricky waters there, especially if it, you know that, that and that game was like it, it had a certain thing we were trying to say as opposed to historical games where you're trying to balance those things out. Um, so I know it's uh, quarter till. Do we want to open it up for Q and A? Um, don't be shy. I think we'll pass around to Mike and. Um, Um, I was curious about the the game that you made the the role playing historical game. I've suddenly forgotten the name. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and you were talking about giving the teachers like different role playing choices that they could make. I, I was just curious about how did you develop those and what were your decisions and thinkings behind creating those different role plays that teachers could use. Yeah, I mean, so for that, that project was uh, very much inspired by a project we'd done up in um, Boston uh, at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. We'd made this sort of 100-person, 100-student uh, live-action Senate LARP um, where kids would come in and play senators for a couple hours. Um, and so we're like, how do we put that, you know, teachers would be like, that sounds awesome. When can I, when can I do that in my classroom? We're like, never. Um, you have to go to Boston. Um, and so uh, we, so this one we were thinking about how do we translate that experience into uh, so people could do it in classrooms across the country. Um, and so uh, we learned a lot of really valuable lessons there about uh, what the sort of value of like being, you know, confronted with other people, getting up, taking positions. And so it's very much um, the, the, for we kind of come up with a very consistent structure that we use to sort of fit different role plays or topics into, but it, you know, really touching on a couple of really key things, like we give every kid a role, um, they have a, someone they're playing, you know, it's not necessarily, and it's, but it's like not like deep role playing um, where you have to play, uh, you know, John Calhoun. It's like you're just a Southern, uh, like a plantation owner or you are a, uh, an abolitionist um, with a little bit of historical detail. So essentially you play yourself, um, but with a little bit of context. And then we uh, make you say that out loud. We like make everyone introduce themselves so they kind of have to be like, oh, remind me who, who again, who are you? And so you get them to kind of state who they are. Um, and then we break them into groups um, and get them to talk to other people like them so that are, have the same sort of uh, groupings um, as they do. And then that gets them kind of riled up and then uh, and be like, yeah, yeah, we're totally right, right? I think it seems like this is the right thing. Um, and then we make them negotiate with other people, be like, now go switch around groups. So a lot of what we're doing is like pretty typical stuff that any teacher would do, right? Like how we would like vary group sizes, uh, give people roles, give people a ch talk, um, a chance to talk to the group and then talk in small groups, um, uh, kind of create problem, uh, solve problems and then, uh, and then sort of be able to offer solutions. So the structure of it is pretty simple. It's like uh, you're presented with like a, what the crisis is, um, you're introduced to your role, then you get a little bit more breakdown on it and then every time we're like, what does this group think? And um, you can just read it off your tablet if you want, or you can elaborate on it if you want. Um, and the kids, uh, a lot of kids do. They'll just like add, you know, if they know anything about the topic, they'll run with it, um, you know, and so, uh, and, if they, and if they don't, they still have stated it out loud, and by stating it out loud, you kind of start to believe it. Um, and then, uh, then you just go through a bunch of committees where we're like, uh, we're tr or a bunch of little smaller groups where you're trying to um, pitch what the solution's gonna be, craft something, and then uh, then you all vote on it at the end, and um, and then there's a discussion afterwards. Like, was that a 17th was that an 18th century solution or 19th century solution or a 21st century solution? And the kids are amazingly good at recognizing the difference between them. That's so. that's, that's important. I, I just want to suggest that if um, if this kind of form is interesting to you, a really simple game you can play. Nobody here made it. It's from a group called Thorny Games. It's called Sign. Um, S-I-G-N, uh, and it's a game about the way, it's a meditation through embodiment on the way that the Nicaraguan sign language was invented. The short version of the game is that Nicaragua didn't have a sign language until the 70s because they were teaching people lip reading. And then as part of an experiment, they brought a bunch of deaf children to the same school to teach them all lip reading at the same time. They did not learn lip reading, but they invented the, a nascent sign language by themselves that became the root of Nicaraguan sign language and you play um, not a simulation, they're very careful not to say that and explicit about that, but you play through a set of exercises where you embody children in a school like that and then invent a sign language. Mm 
Um, first of all, that's super amazing because I just finished listening to this audiobook on the history of languages, and they talked about Nicaraguan sign language and this whole thing. So, like, the fact that there's a game, I'm like super excited. So, super side note. Um, I'm curious as to, because one of the things that seems to be uh, the conversation is kind of like, oh, the, the idea of the game being a punch, and like kind of like what happens next or what happens around it. Um, and one, I'm kind of wondering uh, two things. One, um, what are the possibilities or what do you think the value is of bringing some of these non-traditional narratives into more traditional, like, triple A style games that have much larger reeks and impact? Like, I'm thinking, like, if you told a migrant story through Call of Duty, you would automatically have, like, 50 million people who, like, have this understanding and experience. And I think Call of Duty does a great, it gives you a great experience of, like, war and like in, in, in some kind of way in context. And the other thing I'm curious about is, is uh, right now, um, because all of your games is like, uh, I've, I've never heard of any of them, which is super sad, you know, like, and I work in a gaming school, right? And so for the person who's lay in this space, like, what do you guys think of, is there any type of platform or anything that's being organized that puts these types of games or something into, oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, Games for Change is a, um, a convener and a supporter of this community. And so um, our website has a lot of these games um, and I'm happy to connect with you with offline and give you some more um, content. But yeah, I, you know, I will also admit, I think there's um, probably better ways that, um, to disseminate games. Um, it's a problem for most people making games. I think it's a matter of sometimes finding funding and then it's a matter of getting it to market. Um, so, and um, I'm a, I don't know if folks in the room are familiar with Glass Lab, um, the Games Learning and Assessment Lab. It doesn't exist anymore, so I don't really need to write it down. <laughs> but um, it, uh, I was there sort of on the tail end of it and basically what we did was we took uh, commercial IP like Plans for Zombies, The Sims, um, actually Sid Meier donated um, Civilization V. So we took I, uh, commercial IP and we modded it for common core competencies and we really thought that if we were able to leverage IP from commercial industry, um, we would actually have really fun, compelling content that we could easily get to the classroom. And we actually failed getting it into classrooms in a way that we could continue to um, to grow, which was disappointing and a learning experience for I think a lot of the education um, games and learning um, folks, but um, they're interested. I mean, I, I used to be a video game lobbyist as well, so I've represented and worked with the industry for a long time in a lot of these conversations, and I think now is um, really a, a, a cool time in this space to really see some powerful change from more investment and more, I think, partnership opportunities within the AAA space, within um, kind of non-endemic partners. Um, we're really seeing like AT&T and Verizon and the, te the telecom companies um, kind of coming to this space and also realizing the power of um, interactive media, of games, and what this, what it, what the potential could be if there was more of an investment um, in it or more of a support around getting it to market and getting it into the hands of kids, um, meeting kids where they are, so. Um. You guys think more about this than I do, I'm sure, but my, my, um, my experience, I remember when people started, the federal government started really funding educational games, you know, 10, 12 years ago, they were, um, oh, you know, b b the, the idea was there's these commercial games that are just captivating young people and we have to leverage that for learning. Um, and how are we going to compete with those when, in our educational games? Or, and right away, I, I thought there was a fallacy there. And I, at least I've watched kids play games for a long time. They have a, kids have a category in their head. It's called school game. <laughs> and guess what? They're, it's not competing with like Call of Duty or you know <laughs> their games at home. It's competing with the rest of school, <laughs> and they really dig it. So I mean, it's not. It's a simple. It's a simple point, but I think it's one we have to remember. And the other piece is that all media, I mean, there's been billions of dollars pumped into digital curriculum of all kinds. Most of them are failures. Most of them are not sticking. Billions of dollars lost in that industry. So it's not just, it's not just games that have a hard time getting a foothold and developing a market, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
the one thing I'd also add was too is like uh, when I see like people like it, you'll probably never get uh, a really good migration story out of uh, Call of Duty, um, uh, but, uh, but 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 teachers like what I I'm always inspired by is like how teachers take like pop culture artifacts and then repurpose them right so you know use they, people use Assassin's Creed to teach history or something like that like and that they can use like a popular game um, in the same way that like I was out in a teacher's classroom a couple months ago and she was using you know she was making uh, she was uh, comparing uh, the X-Men with civil rights and was like, uh, who is, which one's, Mar is Magneto or uh, Professor X, Martin Luther King or, uh, <laughs> or uh, Malcolm X? And I was like, it was such a, and they nice. can write essays. And so yeah. I think that's like the, that's the hope, not getting, um, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And X-Men was explicitly about that, right? Like it was designed to do that. It's about, it's about um, bias in, a, in not a very sophisticated way, but that's what it was supposed to be. And I think that like, I think comparisons between film and games are really are, are almost universally stupid. But the one where I think it is is actually kind of true is that like when you look at the way that 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 pop culture film well, there's two things. First of all, if you look at the way that pop culture film can move forward questions of representation in in extremely powerful ways, and I'm just thinking of Wonder Woman and Black Panther, right? And now Watchmen, if you're watching Watchmen, which is a meditation on racism. That's what that show is, and like. The idea that it's Watchmen that's doing that, like it's a comic book property that had to, by the way, nothing to do with race whatsoever in its original incarnation. Like literally nothing more actually said, well, I won't spoil it, but more, more actually pulls out one of the, the key tenants in Watchmen and actually says that that was not true in the comic. He doesn't mind because the, the, the show is so good, but he, he does say that like the race thing you brought into this was not in the original comic in my conception. Um, and games can do that, and they, and they are doing that right now actually. So like, Particularly around LGBTQ stuff, more and more games are starting to feature um, stories that are not heteronormative as part of what they do to, to you know, start kind of exercising that stuff. So very successful games like The Last of Us or um, uh, ah, Life is Strange are, are essentially story games that, that then feature LGBTQ stories and I think that has the same role that something like Will and Grace has in culture or frankly Uncle Tom's Cabin because all of it's the same exercise of like take a popular medium, model the popular medium exactly, change the content to be politically active but keep everything else the same. Because like I, 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 don't, I, I won't go on and on about this but like Uncle Tom's Cabin is a sentimentalist novel and there were sentimentalist novels for like 150 years before Uncle Tom's Cabin and one of them was one of the most popular novels that has ever come across the face of the earth. Um, and so like when that book was written, Stowe knew exactly what she was doing. She was writing a book she knew people would read, right? And, and just writing it about something that they weren't, normally, they weren't normally seeing in that story. And games are starting to do that now. A, little, like a, bit, a bunch around gender, a bunch around LGBTQ issues, a little bit around race. Race is where we're really still very weak in games, but like trying, right? I think there's that. But then the other thing I just want to say is that like, it's also like we ignore, it, I think, sometimes the educational potential of games as they exist right now, right? I learned how to add and subtract and multiply quickly playing Dungeons and Dragons. That's how I did it because I had to add numbers all the time. Like I would roll dice and add numbers all the time. Kids um, in the generation after me learned basic algebra playing Pokemon because people think Pokemon is about like monsters that fight each other, but really it's about adding attack values and subtracting defense values and adding multipliers in. And kids have to do that literally hundreds of times in an individual game, so they're doing math all the time. And so like that purpose of games too is really interesting, and there's really interesting experiments there um, in like the work of Dragon Box, for example, which if you don't know it and you're interested in games and education, you should look at because that company's phenomenal. Um, so I think there's like a few different levers on this, like how the AAA games can do it. The, the easy one is just like, you know, to all that is holy, get more representative, right? And like tell stories that are not the same story over and over again, right? Call, it's very hard to make a Call of Duty where you do not, you do not play the white person shooting the people of color. It's just really, really hard to get that, that narrative out of that storyline. But we don't have to tell that story even in a, a military simulator. Like there's no particular reason why that should be the story we tell. Um, and then, you know, asking sort of like the way that 
um, that there have been very deliberately and de deliberate enterprises in Hollywood, in mainstream television, to start telling stories that are more representative. That's something we can do right away because we can just tell those stories. Um, and so I think around questions like this, you know, you think of like like the sort of Maria full of grace kinds of storylines that pop up in film, games can do the same thing, right? There's nothing stopping games from doing that. That's, that's easy, that's reachable. But then when we start asking questions of like, okay, well how do we get games to do STEM stuff or how do we get games to kind of adhere to common core standards? That's like a, it's a different problem, right? Because we don't, films don't do that either, you know? I think um, Ubisoft did a great job um, with their Assassin's Creed Discovery yeah. Tour. Um, they stripped away all the violence from the game, so you can, if you're learning world, world history in ancient Greece, you can actually go in with the rich history that the game was built on um, and explore what it was like. You can do different quests on the like Olympics, or I mean, it's just it's a great tool for teachers to have in the classroom that allows kids to, as we've talked about on this panel, connect with the content in a way that's super interactive. Um, and rich that has a ton of resources behind it that um, that is doesn't have violence and some of the other components of the 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 um, the real Assassin's Creed, but still has that power of a AAA learning tool. So they get a lot of kudos in, in our book. They actually got the Games for Change Industry Award um, last year. In case you're wondering, who got that? <laughs> um, any more? I'm actually very, uh, the conversation become very interesting when it kind of gravitate towards uh, games in school. <laughs> but uh, personally, I think games are very good at changing mindset, not just teaching skills and the uh, knowledge itself. Uh, can you share some of experience like when you're trying to educate the general public or community where it's not in the classroom setting, um, how you get the early adoption um, and how scale? Yeah, I mean, it, so waiting game was not intended for schools at all. Like literally, that was not the intent. And so the way I do it and the way I advise people to do it is to just be like, like to make a media object people want to consume, right? Because then, because that's the difference. Like I think, I think the point you made is really, really good. Like in the early days of educational games, we have these conversations about how like, I have to beat the teacher. That's really easy when the student sees the teacher every day of the year. Like anything that's shiny will beat the teacher because the students will just be like new thing, right? Um, but in the commercial marketplace, you're competing against, uh, I don't know, gardenscapes. That's hard, gardenscapes, they spent millions of dollars on that thing. That's like, like, like something like 10 years of research into how those games work. So my attitude is like, well make it really radical and stark and shocking and new. Because then you get people for that, right? That's why I was really proud about it, this being like existential dread. Because I think people would read that and be like, wait, there's a game about existential dread? What is that? That makes no sense. I want to go see what that is and then, because that's how I consume stuff, right? Like someone will be like, oh, hey, there's this weird web experience that makes you feel like, like, like you're a sea turtle. And I'll be like, all right, I'll see what a sea turtle is like, whatever. And then if it taught me something about sea turtle conservation, awesome, but I didn't come for that. Right, and that I think that that methodology I think is really good. It's it's hard though, right? It's controversial. So I'm working on this. I'm just, I just nascently started working on this project around um, existential threats, and what I'm trying to sell them on is making a haunted house. Right, like like because existential threats are scary, so it's easy. Right, like I I think we can make lethal autonomous robots and flu pandemic scary, because I think I say that and people get scared, so it's easy jump. Um, but also, if I told you that, like, oh yeah, this is a haunted house about existential threat, what does that mean? What is that? Like, oh no, it's a, yeah, it's a haunted house about how the flu is going to kill everyone and how asteroids would destroy everyone on the face of the earth. You'd be sort of interesting, but then if you read a horror web, a horror review site or like Time Out wrote scariest haunted house in New York about existential threat, I think I could get you to go, right? Because you'd be like, I want to see how they did that. Right, and that I think is like the methodology. So it's, 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 this is not like a noble gesture I'm talking about here, right? Like this is literally leaning into the entertainment and just saying like, okay, what is the entertainment good at? Yeah, like what is it good at? But that, like this is like, but this is the methodology that gets used in mainstream film and in television and stuff like that, right? Like you, you take something that you think will be compelling to the audience 
and you embed the message into it. And there's a, there's a bunch of ways to do that. You can do it by aping something very familiar, right? So that like you know that people like X, and so they will probably like X plus political message as long as I don't screw up X. You can do that by being by like trying to find the niche in the audience that's already sort of interested in stuff and then attacking that niche really hard. So it's like, oh, I bet you I could like board games, for example, um, are like right now modern board games are deeply tied to all sorts of weird little crunchy history, right? Like super bizarre histories you'd never think of, like 19th century mail services, right? Stuff like that. That's like a literal. There's literally a board game about that, right? Um, <laughs> So like not hard to get history into board games. If I really want to teach you something, like like a teach gamers something, I might just throw it in a board game and just make a good game out of it. And then you suddenly realize like, oh, there were mail services in the 19th century that competed. That's interesting, right? So I think that that's, you, you, you think about it very differently because you, you're going out into the wild, right? And out in the wild are all the other animals you're competing with. One more? Or right, we're done. OK. So I'm interested in this historical thinking idea, because at the museum, we w one of the things that I really try to work on with visitors is how to try how to interpret what happened in the past without judging it by the, the standards of the present. Um, and you know that kind of context for why people thought the way they thought, what kind of information they had at their disposal. And the, you know, the, 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 it's happening to us. I mean, some, at some point, people will say, how did you let this happen, right? And, and without calling us some kind of ist. Mm -hmm. So how do you incorporate that into, your, um, into the curriculum or the game? Well, it's a, that's a great question. So uh, that's pr sometimes called presentist thinking, right? And, um, it's called Ernest. Uh, yeah, well, no, but it's but it's a uh, it's something that we all do and and kids do really powerfully and um, so we try to be explicit about it that part of some of the historical thinking skills are to um, actually talk to kids about that about suspending our our automatic judgments and and like you said I think. Are, are we coming up with a 19th century solution, a, a 20th century solution, or a 21st century solution? That, that, that understanding mindsets that, that operate in history that um, people didn't believe the way we do then. And, and here's some evidence about what they believed. And it's rooted, it's, and it's not just about them being an ist. It's about, it's always rooted in interests. So that's the key thing. I think we, t we, in the games, there's an effort to say, you know, Southern plantation owner. Interest is in, you know, a labor view of, of you know, wh what African bodies are, you know. And so, yes, we, it's, it's fine. We can understand that as in, unacceptable in our, in our world. But what was going on then? How did the conflict unfold? Um, based on that, and and you know, I, I think because there's always it's always dynamic and there's change happening. Kids can, I mean that that has to be the story. You're you're showing change how change happens, and so you know the fugitive slave law, you know, gets people really riled up in the north because all of a sudden there's white southerners coming in to chase. African Americans who fled to their states, and that's what gets them upset. It's like, oh, the slave power is encroaching on it. It's white people getting pissed off at other white people's power. They weren't really worried about black bodies, you know. So, so, but kids, but but kids really can if you stop and give them an opportunity to like. That's why role playing is very dangerous because all of a sudden you're inviting people to to. Um, to emote from that, uh, that's dangerous in classrooms. To get students from, to emote from a place of a southern plantation owner is bad and dangerous. So, so we help teachers understand that position, view, goes along with interest, and you gotta link those. Okay, I think. Well, create ground rules for kids not to be able to 
use language. Okay. <laughs> Laura? Yeah? If you can just add this in the bubble time, yeah. I'll throw it in the air. You don't have to respond. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'll just throw it into the air, and then people can leave and we can all think about it later. <laughs> um, but there's been kind of floating around in the room that almost the setting itself doesn't matter, but it's the experience, it's the engagement with a particular system that's the important part. Does that mean that in this idea of empathy or engagement or ideas of kind of historical literacy, well, maybe not that, that the historical time period doesn't matter, rather that the history itself can constrain what you're trying to do, that, for example, you're, you're doing a game about uh, slavery or the fact that doing the experiment with the senators, it doesn't matter that you're talking about U.S. history, it's embodying the experience of negotiation and debate. And so in some ways, hearing something can throw up blinders that you experience thinking about the history all of a sudden. Let me rephrase. Um, the idea being that you hear it's a game about being a refugee and a migrant might not let you get to the audience that you want to talk about. But if you suddenly abstract that, something like Papers, Please, where you're playing as someone as a passport control that is the Soviet Union, but it's not really the Soviet Union because it's an abstraction of a country. I suppose that's the thrust yeah. of my question. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, I want to respond because this is a really good question, right? And this is a question that comes up a lot in, and I mean, I'm sure you've, this, this has been floating around the games and impact movement for a really long time, which is like, to what extent do you have to simulate to teach something, and can you teach something outside of that? There's a really good... Um, uh, piece that uh, Vi Hart worked on called The Parable of the Polygons. This is like my favorite example of this, which is teaching you about how self-segregation um, in communities that seems totally um, individually isolated will lead to large-scale segregation over entire regions. And that like, that, and it's basically because Vi Hart's a mathematician, she's like studying how like statistical distribution happens, and she's basically making an argument that like, that 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 um like like race or class based or cultural based um, segregation in a city will happen, even if you have absolutely no laws enforcing it, as long as people make preferences not to live in diverse neighborhoods. Like it'll just happen automatically. Now she she doesn't do this by having you model a city with different like ethnic groups in the city or different religious groups in the city. She just gives you shapes and she's like, here's the rule: each shape is happy when it's next to a certain number of other shapes. Go and then you do it and you create a completely segregated grid, right, just by doing that. And so that's, like, that's a good example of like, what I mean by when I say punch, right? Like, does that teach you the rules about, um, about the historic um, ways that redlining and, um, and white flight have created segregated cities? No, of course not. Like, it's way too, too stripped down. But what it gives you is a sense that like, oh, these things are system, these, these are system-driven things that replicate themselves even without explicit instruction, right? That's what you walk away when you, when you play that experience. And then when the, the surrounding website, again, Game Plus, talks about, oh, and this is what we see in certain kinds of cities and this is what white flight is, then you kind of understand it in a different way because you saw that interaction. And then that, the question is like, okay, so to what extent can we use abstract interactions to accomplish that? And that can take place outside of historical context if the lesson the game is trying to teach is not a historic lesson or can be abstracted away from the history. But that's tricky, right? And especially in educational settings, it's very tricky, right? And this all lives, I think, on the spectrum that uh, you know, we didn't really talk about it, and I, that's why I wanted to, to respond because I think it's a really important one about what simulation is and like the value of simulation. And like games and new media in particular have this massive problem where we start to believe as the media gets more rich, as the media gets more um, multimodal, as the media gets more immersive, whatever that means, um, suddenly now we can have the experience of. Right? And most media realize you can't have the experience of because my media experience stops and I don't suddenly stop being Palestinian, right? So I can't really experience the experience of a Palestinian because I'm not Palestinian, right? I, 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 can, get, I, can, have, I can get an, ex an emotional experience that's related to that. I might be able to build empathy, hyper complicated word, right? Like, but I, I certainly can't have that experience. So then 
we want to abstract back, right? We want to take a step back from pure simulation and say like, no, we're not going to pretend like you actually are Palestinian. We're not going to pretend you are an asylum seeker. We're not going to pretend you are uh, a person at this moment in history. But then the further away we go from that, the more abstract we're getting, right? So now we're, it's just less and less and less about the topic. And that's, that's like the interesting complexity of this kind of design, right? It's like, how do you do it? And it's, it's very, very helpful to have the plus Right, because we know how to do the plus. The plus is like solved problem in a lot of ways. Like we know how that happens in the schools. The question is like where does the punch that the game deliver come most effectively? And then what can we honestly say games do? And I and I'm saying this so emphatically, and I apologize that I, I hogged the microphone for this part, but like because VR is lying about this right now, like lying through its teeth about what kinds of things it creates, and it's very dangerous like the kind of lies they're telling. Like, th like the thing things that documentarians, photographers, journalists right. would never in a million years say, VR says it does. And so we just have to be very cautious. I, I want the whole industry to be cautious about like what we mean by empathy, right? Like, and that, that we don't forget the lessons of other art forms, which is the realization that like lived experience is different than art, right? And that art has a value towards changing our perspectives and giving us awareness and opening the door to conversation but art is not lived experience and cannot be definitionally, like aesthetically definitionally lived experience. All right, well thank you everyone. And um, I will say, you know, as Games for Change, um, if you want more information on um, topics related not just to immigration, but broader issues, um, we do have a ton of, um, we have a great community and a ton of um, contacts and resources I'm happy to pass along. So feel free to reach out and, um, Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I don't know if you want to come up and give any. Okay.